Post Tenebras Lux After Darkness Light. <laughs> All right. There is nobody in the chat, but I thought I would go live. I wanted to do this uh, before, but things were so hectic during the conference and everything else. Hey, Sahi Luke, good to see you. I just, uh, today we started our trip back from California. Actually, we, we left California on Monday and went to my mom's in Las Vegas and stayed there for a few days and then left to start our several day drive home to South Carolina. And along the way, we got a flat tire <laughs> and my tire was stuck. So uh, we were out there for a couple of hours trying to trying to fix it. I was out there kicking it and doing everything under the sun and waiting for a crazy uh, tow truck driver to come along. And he was a couple hours out. Uh, anyways, there's my son in the background. He's saying hello. <laughs> uh, he wanted to go to bed, but I wanted to go live. So he's he's learning the, the life of a, of a YouTuber. I guess I'm a YouTuber of sorts. Um, Good to see you all. Sahi Luke was at the conference. It was good to see him. I don't know who else is in the chat, if anybody else was there. I see Chloe. I see Freeze. Yahweh Glorified. Virginia. Catherine Linda Clark. William Bradford. Yeah, so the conference uh, went well. It went well. Uh, Sahi Luke got to see it firsthand, but there were several lectures that took place. Um, David Wood, of course, was there. He gave some lectures. Uh, Jay Smith was there. He lectured. And uh, Dr. Edward Dalcor was there and did uh, some, some of them. I wasn't there for. I was around. I was in the vicinity, but I was mostly focused on, uh, you know, psyching up for my debate with Shabir, but or else I was at the bookstore. I was down at the Islamic bookstore. Hey, Waylon, good to see you. Hey, Slam. Um, yeah, so I was uh, I was in the vicinity, and I know they were doing some lectures, some, uh, what do they call them, uh, panel discussions on various topics. I don't know what's available online, but if you go to the M2M network, there might be some additional things available. As for the debates, the three debates, I know that uh, my debates, both of my debates are up on the Act 17 Apologetics page and on Fander Films, Jay Smith's channel, and uh, maybe some other places, the M2M YouTube page, of course. And then David's debate with Jay Smith on the existence of Muhammad uh, that's up on Act 17 Apologetics and on Fander Films. And I saw that uh, DCCI, uh, Hatun Tash, had a show on with, uh, with Jay after the debates. But then it looked like they took it down and the video is private now. So I'm not, I'm not sure what accounts for that. But uh, Slam said those were great debates. Um, and yeah, I was pleased with the, the the debates. I know that you know some people may think I I go into the debates without any kind of uh, apprehensiveness. I, I'm I'm not sure if that's the the best word to use, but typically, no matter who I'm debating, you know, even if it's somebody I know doesn't have a clue of you know doesn't know their left from their right, there's still a little bit of uh, anxiousness before the debates that immediately sort of disappears when the debate starts. Once, once I hear the other person say something contrary to the gospel of Christ, suddenly any of that uh, apprehensiveness just goes out the window. But uh, in the Lord's graciousness, I didn't have any kind of, uh, you know, n none of those feelings were there prior to the debates with Shabir. So, so the Lord was gracious. 
Um, and uh, I was well pleased with how it all went. I was really surprised at what Shabir said and didn't say. And I expressed that in the debate. Uh, at least I expressed my surprise at what he did say, not as much at what he didn't say. I haven't necessarily collected all of my thoughts on that, but um, yeah, Harvin says uh, he spent most of his time arguing outside of the debate topic. And, you know, I think so if you if you look at Shabir's prior debates on the Trinity, he normally tries to argue three points, three overarching points. He says that he, you know, is basically going to look at uh, the first three letters in the word three, right? He's got an acrostic going on. Uh, so text, history, and reason. So text would be arguments based on the Bible. In his mind, the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity, or at least he claims in his mind that the Bible doesn't think the Trini uh, teach the Trinity. I'm not so sure if Shabir has convinced himself that the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity, or if he isn't just arguing that in order to uh, force his conclusion. Perhaps more on that in a moment. Uh, but then he normally argues that the Bible doesn't, or excuse me, history doesn't bear out that this was the view of the of the Christian church, that this is actually a post-apostolic uh, development that takes a number of centuries to actually unfold and, uh, you know, come to its full flower expression. And then he moves from there to arguments from reason, where he argues that the Trinity is contrary to reason. And so I think that the, the debate topic, it was narrowly focused. It was, does the Bible teach the doctrine of the Trinity? That in itself kind of threw him off his game. He wanted to uh, focus on his normal three issues, <clears throat> but uh, by, by sort of, you know, taking his normal tact, he ended up covering a good bit of material that just wasn't relevant, right? The, um, uh, the history of the church's articulation of the doctrine of the Trinity was irrelevant to the specific question. Now, I think he could have done a better job of making the history relevant. He could have said, you know, if the doctrine of the Trinity is clearly taught in the Bible, then we would expect it to have been the clear teaching of the early church. And since in his mind, it's, it's not there in the early church, then that at least makes it suspect when somebody tries to interpret the Bible that way. Now, I disagree with that, obviously. The Bible does teach the doctrine of the Trinity quite clearly, and that was recognized by the early fathers. But the way Shabir presented it just ended up looking entirely irrelevant and as a colossal red herring. Um, I didn't get to spend as much time as I would have if uh, on the issue of the history of the doctrine in the apostolic and post-apostolic fathers, you know, if that was the topic of the debate. But I did mention that the irony of ironies is that, you know, Justin Martyr, whom Shabir said I was fundamentally in agreement with, affirmed the Apostles' Creed I mean, the Apostles' Creed, I know a lot of Christians have lost sight of this, but in the early centuries of the church, before a person could be baptized, they first had to be catechized. And the, the rationale for this, when you think about it, is, is wise. I mean, it, it, it makes a great deal of sense. It, it seems to be in conflict with the New Testament that they would spend a lot of time catechizing a person. Because if you look at the New Testament, when the Apostles preached, and a person professed faith, they would immediately be baptized, right? That's that's the consistent pattern in the uh, book of Acts, for example. A person professes faith, he's immediately baptized. However, we have to remember that in the, at least in the first place, when the apostles are going to Jews, they're going to people who are already fundamentally familiar with the teaching of the scriptures. They had a, a Old Testament foundation. They were sufficiently schooled in the writings of the prophets and the apostles. They went to synagogue every Sabbath day. And so when the apostles came along and proclaimed in Jesus the fulfillment of these things, it didn't require a whole lot of uh, you know, 
background discussion to make sure that the people were uh, accurate, you know, they were professing the true faith. They, they, you know, the, the profession of faith in Christ, once they came to the realization that he was the Messiah, all, all of the various threads of the Old Testament would come together for them. However, as the apostles began going out more and more into the Gentile world, the Gentiles were full of all sorts of false notions that would have had to have been disabused, right? They had to have been uh, disabused of these ideas uh, before their profession of faith could have been, you know, taken as credible. And so what the early church did was they made sure that before a person was baptized, they were sufficiently schooled in the writings of the prophets and the apostles, particularly the basic outline of the faith that you find in the Apostles' Creed. In the Apostles' Creed, you have the threefold profession of faith, profession of faith in the Father, profession of faith in the Son, and profession of faith in the Spirit, and various things related to each of those persons. So, for example, the Apostles' Creed professes faith in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. It professes faith in one Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and it professes faith in him as the Son of God, the one who became flesh, the one who died or was crucified under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. And then you have the profession of faith in the Holy Spirit. And along with the profession of faith in the Spirit, uh, profession of uh, faith uh, uh, that or profession of faith in him, and you're uh, also along with that confessing faith in the church that Christ established in baptism and, and that sort of thing. So the Apostles' Creed was just a basic summary of the Christian faith. And when the church taught that, that creed, they would have expounded on those doctrines. And it didn't require them to say everything in the Apostles' Creed that would have been articulated in the catechetical process. Okay, right. The word catechesis, by the way, nobody should be uh, thrown off by that. It's a thoroughly biblical idea and even a biblical word. But the idea goes all the way back to a passage like Genesis 6, or excuse me, Deuteronomy 6, where Moses told uh, Israelites, you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You're to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then it says that you're to teach these things to your children, right? You're to talk about them when you walk along the way, when you sit down, when you rise up. So, the Old Testament instructed believers to educate their children in the faith. That's essentially the process of catechesis. You also see it as far back as Genesis, where God says he chose Abraham and then says, for he will teach his children after him, his descendants after him. So uh, catechesis is a thoroughly biblical thing. However, when you're talking about conversion, you're not talking about a person being raised in the faith, but a person converting from outside the faith. And so the process would have been a bit, uh, uh, at least preparatory to baptism, required uh, Warrior Woman, says A. Raj Rocks. Um, well, I praise the Lord, Warrior Woman, for his uh, goodness and graciousness to me. And, um, uh, oh, somebody's calling me a coward. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to you, DJ. Um, <laughs> I, I just debated Shabir Ali and DJ, DJ here is calling me a coward. <laughs> How many of you think that DJ is a better representative of the newfangled pagan religion of Islam than Shabir Ali, a veteran debater of the past, I don't know, 20 years, maybe 30 years. I'm not sure how long Shabir has been around. Um, but uh, <laughs> in any case, yeah, I, I, I'm grateful. The Lord was gracious to me. My, my two main overarching goals when I go into a debate are, number one, glorify the triune God and vindicate his truth, and number two, edify his people. Subordinate to that, I also hope to show Christ to unbelievers. I, I want to see unbelievers come to the faith. And in the case of those who will not come to faith, uh, I hope to shut their mouths so that they no longer, and I'm not saying that in any kind of mean-spirited sense, I just mean uh, they're speaking against the truth, so I hope to 
uh, you know, make them reticent to speak against the Lord and his truth. Um, all right. So DJ says, try debating me. Okay. Um, DJ, are you still here? DJ, are you still in the room? And are you a Muslim? DJ, does anybody know who DJ is? I don't mean like personally, but have you seen DJ before? Oh, DJ. <laughs> I don't know if that means warrior woman knows who DJ is. But if, if DJ is, uh, DJ, you still here? Okay, Sahih Luke says DJ is a clown. Because, DJ, I was, I was willing to give you a shot at the title. If you want to come live on the Act 17 Apologetics page, I will be happy to debate you. I have never turned down a debate in my life, and I'm not a snob. I'm not a theological snob. Even though I don't think you hold a candle to Shabir, I am willing to give you a shot at the title. I'll make you famous, to quote Billy the Kid. I'm your Huckleberry, to quote Doc Holliday. DJ, where you at? Come on, DJ, bring that beat back. Where, where's the DJ at? I think the record skipped. DJ. <laughs> well, I don't know. He, he called me a coward and he disappeared. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, maybe he'll maybe he'll pop back up. Um, but uh, I'm uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord. Oh, and I, I wanted to particularly thank. All of you, I wanted to thank all of you for your prayers. I wanted to thank all of you who supported. It was a big help, so I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, there was a little bit of excess in the support, so I was able to buy some books at the Muslim bookstore, which means many more uh, insights to come. Of course, I haven't exhausted the uh, five or six insights I have, but um, uh, many more to come. You probably heard Sam. Uh, Sam's already been hitting the keyboard, going at it, because uh, he also went to uh, he went to the Islamic bookstore and, and got a bunch of stuff. So he's been uh, busily uh, pounding away at the keyboard, uh, writing articles and stuff, and I'm anxious to dig into. Uh, into the stuff I got. Yeah, I got a bunch of great stuff. In fact, uh, I don't have all of the books here, but I'll show you a few. Let me, uh, actually, so one of the books, oh, I guess it's not in here. I was going to show you one of the books that I had before the debate that I was reading. Oh, I know what I did with that. It's in here. It's in here. Just show you a few of these things here. So uh, this this is a book. It's called Allah's Beautiful uh, Most Beautiful Names. It's written by Muhammad Mahdi Al Sharif, and he is a. Um, I'm not really. Sh Let's see who published this. Uh, okay. So I'm not exactly sure if he is a Salafi or an Ashari, but I will find out. I will find out. This is from uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Sali al Uthaymin, and he was most definitely a uh, Athari. And this is two volumes. It's his uh, uh, commentary on Kitab at Tawheed. Uh, so, uh, he's basically, he's basically giving his commentary on the book of, uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, 
uh, bin uh, Suleiman at Tamimi. And so this will, this is two volumes. That'll account for some good study there. This is a commentary by Al Uthaymin, the same Al Uthaymin, two volumes. It's a commentary on Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, Al Akida Al Wasatiya. And so uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was one of the forerunners of the modern Salafi movement before uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahab. And uh, I got a couple of smaller books here. This one's by a, a Sufi sheikh on, uh, on Creed, so on Akita. This one is another book on Allah's attributes by Al Tamimi. And this one is a book by Al Barbahari, who is also an Athari. Uh, for those that don't know, an Athari is essentially a Salafi. Salafi would be a more uh, modern and somewhat pejorative term. Some Salafis don't like that word. They like even less the word Wahhabi. Uh, but Athari refers to the creed that's held by uh, those groups. But here is here is a book. Um, oh, at least I think it's here. This is a book that I had before the debate, and I'm going to tell you why this book is significant. Okay, this book it's called Anthropomorphism in Islam. It's written by a Jewish woman uh, who is. Uh, her name is Livnat, Holt, Livnat Holtzman. She holds the chair of the Department of Arabic at Bar Ilan University in Israel. I'll tell you why this is important. Um, oh, is that the new magic backpack? <laughs> Actually, as an aside, um, David is going to start on, I, I think, December 1st. He's starting a, a whole month where he's going to test the waters and see if there's an interest in a regular program, I think every night for at least an hour. And it's going to be kind of a rotation. He's going to have Tony Costa on. And if you haven't heard Tony Costa, you're missing out. Uh, I love Tony Costa. He does great stuff. He's going to have Sam on. And you all know Sam. And then he's going to have me on. And maybe just us three. He might bring in someone else, but we're going to basically do a rotation and we're going to address different theological issues. We're going to invite Muslims to come on the show. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, but uh, I, and I'm going to continue my own shows on here. I have a number of series I want to continue. But uh, so so for many years, I. I was studying the Islamic sources. I, as you know, have said a lot about anthropomorphism in Islam. And for me, what was happening was I, you know, I, I started studying Islam because I was surrounded by Muslims at one point. I was converted in 1993 as an 18 year old kid in prison. The Lord and his graciousness took me out of that. I was released two and a half years later and have been out ever since. Eventually went and finished my high school education, went to college, went to seminary, became a pastor, now serve in prisons. And so it's been about over 25 years or so, or about that. And, um, but I was surrounded by Muslims at one point and I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn what I can about uh, this religion and in that way, communicate the gospel to them. And I assumed going into it, this will warn you against assumptions. I assumed because all these Muslims were saying, oh, you know, we believe in God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We believe in, uh, you know, Adam, Noah, Abraham, David and, and the rest uh, that we have these differences. But we have at least a fundamental uh, agreement when it comes to the nature and attributes of God. Right, the nature and attributes of God. I'm not here talking about the Trinity. That was obvious from the beginning. They don't believe in the triune God. And so who they think God is, is entirely wrong. But what God is, I thought we had a basic agreement on. 
I thought they at least believe that God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, like the God of the Bible, that he has uh, attributes and qualities that are consistent with just that sort of being, a, a God who is pure spirit, without body, parts, or passions, and that sort of thing, that he fills heaven and earth, that he even transcends heaven and earth. There's nothing that can contain him, but there's also nothing that can, uh, you know, lock him outside of his creation. He's capable of interacting with his creatures. I, I just assumed that we had those sorts of things in common, and where we really differed was when it came to the identity of God, uh, whether God is Father, Son, and Spirit. But the more and more I read the Islamic sources, the more I started realizing, no, it doesn't even sound like we have the same notion of God's nature. We don't even have the same idea of the kind of being we're talking about. And I especially was stumbling over certain statements regarding uh, Allah's anatomy. I, I kept reading them thinking, well, it seems to me like it should be obvious that a Muslim would understand certain things figuratively. But the more I read the Quran and the more I read the Hadith, the more it sounds like these things are being understood literally. And so then I took a step back and I started asking the question, you know, uh, Muhammad was a pagan, right? He was reared in a pagan context. And it wouldn't be surprising if he held anthropomorphic notions of his deity, just like his pagan counterparts, right? Um, even, even the Jews in Arabia, we know, were anthropomorphous. I'll do something on that at some other time. But remember, these aren't Old Testament Jews. These aren't Second Temple Jews. These are post-Christian Jews. They're even uh, later than the, the Talmudic rabbis. And, and uh, you know, they're not even necessarily strictly tied to uh, the Talmudic developments. These are people that are, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about 6th and 7th century Jews who had been uh, severed from uh, their other, uh, their moorings for, for quite a, uh, a bit of time. So in any case, uh, I started thinking maybe maybe Muhammad doesn't really hold these notions about God that I assumed that he did. And I started looking at things like, uh, thank you guys for those uh, for those super chats, by the way. I, I, I display them on the screen, but I'm not using um, I'm not using StreamYard. So thank you, man, on a mission. Man on a Mission said, you did super awesome decimating Shabir, Anthony. I hope we get to see you more so we grow your channel and get you off your second job. Thank you so much, Man on a Mission. That is the goal. Um, and I can assure you I love to engage the fight. So uh, the more that's possible, the more I will do it. Um, and I spend, I don't know if people understand, I, I spend a great bit of time. I don't take anything for granted or take anything lightly. Um, you know, I go into these things having spent uh, just, I mean, I don't even know how many hours I would, I spend on these things. I, I uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good bit of time. You know, I'm always reading, always thinking. And so uh, just know that uh, I, I put in all that effort and, uh, and then Nada, thank you so much as well. She said, thanks for bringing Allah's far off and ignored attribute to the center of mainstream debate. Shabir was so shook that he threw the Sunnah under the bus. Yes, he did. Uh, it was beautiful to witness. Womb of Allah. Now, I don't know if you caught this, Nada, but this is where I'm going with this whole discussion on anthropomorphism. It wasn't simply the Hadith of the womb, but I brought out that Allah has loins, according to the Hadith. And, and this, this, is the, this is the whole point of Livnat Holtzman. Okay. Now, now, follow along with me here. So I'm going to skip over my whole anthropomorphism lecture and just just uh, just understand that there was a lot of stuff that I kept reading and I kept thinking, you know, this all sounds literal to me, even though it seems like it 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 should be figurative. It, I mean, because Muhammad's claiming to believe in the same God that Jews and Christians believe in. When we read the Old Testament, we recognize there are figures of speech. When you look at didactic portions of scripture, 
Uh, they explicitly teach that God is spirit, that God is infinite, that God uh, can't be confined or limited to space or time or matter or anything like that. And so these other passages that talk about hands or things like that are either poetic references to God or they're referring to a divine theophany where God temporarily appears in human form. And But I'm reading these passages in the Quran and the Hadith and they just keep looking literal to me and I'm thinking, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? And then I learn there are all these Muslims in history, the earliest Muslims who are saying this. And there are, uh, you know, reformist Muslims like the, uh, like Ibn Taymiyyah. And by reformist, I mean Muslims who are saying we need to go back to the Sunnah. We need to go back to what was taught by the first three generations, by Muhammad's companions and, his, and their successors. And uh, they're forcefully arguing against these new developments of other Muslims who are saying he doesn't have these qualities. So in any case, in all of this study, I'm reading people that are dealing with these hadith that are talking about Allah having not only a face, eyes, multiple eyes, not just one eye, not just two eyes, but three eyes, four eyes, more eyes, right? Who knows how many eyes? But he has a, a, multitude, a multitude of eyes. I'm reading about Allah's hands and how Allah likes to do all sorts of things with his hands. He plants trees with his hands. He writes books with his hands. Uh, there's a hadith that says that Allah... Uh, you know, wrote the Torah for Moses while leaning back on a rock and you could hear the screech of the quill as he was writing. So they're, they're quite literal, right? You hear Hadith where it talks about Allah stroking Adam's back. So he gave him the first back rub in history. Hadith about Allah touching Muhammad's back and Muhammad feeling its coolness in his chest and it fit between Muhammad's shoulder blades. Hadith talking about his palms, his fingers, his fingertips. On and on it goes that, you know, it just doesn't end. And, you know, so... Uh, and it talks about his shin, not multiple shins, but but a shin. And it talks about uh, feet um, and his side. Uh, it talks about there are some hadiths that talk about Allah being a uh, looking like a youth and uh, being beardless and wearing green uh, a green robe. Um, and so you know, I'm just looking at this stuff and I'm just thinking, my goodness, what what in the world is going on here? Uh, it's starting to look like some kind of Hindu deity with all these arms and, and everything in the wrong places. And um, and by the way, there's some pretty crude stuff when you get into all this. That um, There's actually a book by uh, Joseph von S. And uh, maybe I'll bring this up in another debate. But Joseph von S. wrote something called The Youthful God. And what he's referring to are these hadiths where Allah is portrayed as a youth. As a, as a beardless youth. And what he points out is that because these hadiths per, portrayed Allah this way, and because the Quran tells Muslims to uh, remember Allah, to engage in dhikr, uh, which is the act of, of meditating on Allah and, and thinking about him and looking forward to the day when they'll see his face, because this was the case, they thought he was a youthful uh, man, young kid with a, without a beard. There were Muslims, early Muslims in, in, in Iran, in uh, Isfahan, other places, who actually would, would try to facilitate this practice of remembering Allah by staring at young boys. They would, these men, these Muslim men, bearded men, would stare at young boys in order to facilitate their longing to see the face of Allah. And he said there were some pretty um, sordid things that went along with that. And I'll just leave it to you to kind of fill in those blanks. I hate to even think about it. Uh, but in any case, that was a tangent. So I'm reading all this stuff. I'm reading Muslim literature, not just the Hadith, but Muslim literature talking about... Um, uh, uh, and I haven't forgotten to, to look at these other super chats, by the way, guys. Thank you so much. Um, but I'm looking at these other uh, books by Muslims, and they're talking about Allah's gonads. And I'm thinking, where in the world are they getting this stuff about his gonads from? And I keep looking. I'm looking in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, at Termidi, uh, you know, Abi Dawood, and, and so forth. And I'm thinking, I, I don't find it, but they're referring to these hadiths. 
And so, you know, I do find the Hadith about Allah's womb, right? Or the, the womb uh, that Allah created and how this womb is talking with Allah and so forth. And Hadith about the womb growing a tongue and touching Allah's side and all this stuff. But I can't find the reference to Allah's loins. Okay. So this, this was going on for years. I mean, uh, you could ask David and Sam. I mean, I don't know how long ago it was, like 10 years ago, I was making reference to Allah's loins and how I couldn't find the references. And even, even Sam didn't know where those references were. And everybody knows that Sam's the Assyrian encyclopedia. So what happened is I picked up this here book, this book by Livnat Holtzman, Anthropomorphism in Islam. The challenge of uh, traditionalism. Okay, so she's talking about what the early Muslims taught, and in here she discusses the history of the hadith about Allah's loins and the womb reaching up and grabbing hold of Allah where it counts and getting Allah to do what she wanted. Okay, now you've all heard the saying, you know, you got them by the you know gonads. That's how you get a person to do what you want, right? Well, the womb is apparently where this all began. This primordial feminine womb reached up and, and got Allah and, and got a firm hold. And um, I, I'm, I know I set this for, for uh, not for kids, right? Um, and, and the womb got Allah to promise her that he would bless those who establish the ties of kinship, those who are good to their relations. Well, uh, but she points out that in the history of the transmission of this hadith, even the traditionalists who affirmed these attributes for Allah were embarrassed by this one. Okay, they were embarrassed. Now, on the one hand, they affirmed it. Okay, they affirmed that Allah has loins. They insisted that this must be affirmed. They even used it as a test of orthodoxy. The Hanbali school, uh, the Hanbali madhab after Ahmed bin Hanbal, the famous champion of the uncreated nature of the Quran over against the Mu'tazili, the one all Muslims look back to as, as their saint Athanasius, right? That Muhammad, uh, or excuse me, Ahmed bin Hanbal, that bin Hanbal said uh, uh, that this is a test of orthodoxy. You have to affirm this hadith. But... Uh, but they were still embarrassed by it because you know how, uh, uh, you know, uh, Muslims are, are a bit uptight about some of these, uh, so, uh, any references. You even heard Hit Shabir in the, in the debate, right, where he said, I didn't know you could say loins in a church. <laughs> I'm thinking, how many churches have you been to? <laughs> Do you go every Sunday? Do you go morning and evening? We have morning and evening services at our church. You know, how often does Shabir go to church to know whether or not they use the word loins in church? In any case, uh, I mean, haven't you ever heard the expression, gird up your loins? That's a biblical expression. I guess he might think I'm one of those Christians who would be afraid to read Ezekiel 28, but I'm not. In any case, um, so, but they were so embarrassed, scandalized by this, even though they thought it was a test of orthodoxy, that they actually put notations in their recounting of the Hadith, their, their transcriptions of the Hadith. They put notations not to say these Arabic words out loud. So whenever they would, re would read the Hadith, they uh, read out loud the words referring to Allah's loins, but they knew it was there. And what this meant was that there would have been some Muslims who had only heard a sanitized recitation of this hadith. And that's why if you look, for example, in Sahih Muslim, you'll see the hadith about Allah's womb or the womb, but you won't see references to the loins. However, however, the hadith about Allah's loins is in Sahih Bukhari, but, but with this caveat. In, uh, when you look at certain copies of uh, Sahih Bukhari, like the translation of Muhammad Mushin Khan, which is the famous one, Muhammad Mushin Khan strikes the Arabic phrase from, from the, the text and doesn't include the Arabic translation, but he does include the Arabic in his condensed version. He has a, a, uh, a one-volume uh abridgment of Sahih Bukhari, 
where he, he even though it's an abridgment of Sahih Bukhari, he contains, he gives you the whole hadith about Allah's loins. And uh, in the it's it's there in the Arabic, but he doesn't translate it in the English. And so she talks about all this kinds of stuff. She talks about uh, much more than that related to the, the fact of Allah's loins. So I went into the debate knowing that there's not only this hadith that talks about Allah's loins, but that by bringing up this hadith, I would in effect also be grabbing Allah by the loins and uh, throwing him uh, throwing him to the curb. Uh, and as you could see in the debate, um, Shabir was uncomfortable with that, and that was what I was going for. All right. Thank you, Raj uh, Vengalil. I hope I pronounced your name right. Thank you so much for the super chat. Um I know I'm, I'm way behind here on the comments, but uh, Brenda said you did a fantastic job in your debates with Shabir. He was clearly unable to answer your arguments with any subs, uh, substantive rebuttals. Yes, uh, uh, that had to be painful for Shabir. It was a boxing match. You know, if it was a boxing match, uh, you knocked Shabir out on first round. Matt 2819 says... Um, yeah, so Morg123 Morg says, Zachary Nyquan said, Islam is the only religion that has not adopted anthropomorphism. You know, the irony is that I've heard clips of Zachary Nyk actually talking about, you know, what they try to do is they say, uh, on the one hand, they want to say these attributes are literal. We mean a literal face, a literal hand. That's what they mean, but they want to say they're not like ours. And that's how they think they're getting around anthropomorphism. But that doesn't get you around anthropomorphism. Okay. Just to say these attributes are not like ours doesn't, you know, my hands, you even heard Shabir saying the, the hand of a record player is not like my hand. Okay. It's still a hand. It, it, it still means it, it's some sort of circumscribed thing that bears enough resemblance to what we call a hand, that it can be called a hand, right? It's, it, it may not be, the, the, the hand of a record player may not be the same as my hand, but it's still this circumscribed thing uh, that performs a function sufficiently similar to the function of my hand that it can be called that, right? Um, so uh, Zachary Nike thinks he's getting around anthropomorphism by saying, oh, but it's not like our hand. Well, that's just poppycock, right? Remember, Allah's hand fit between Muhammad's two shoulder blades. Allah's hand stroked Adam's back. Allah's hand did all these things that presuppose specific limitation. All right. Kafir Linda, thank you so much. Uh, she says, kick on down, family. Donate so Anthony can uh, learn more. Yes, thank you so much, Linda. Um, JDR said, Anthony, did you notice what Shabir said in the debate, he said Jesus was there before the world began. Um, uh, so I might have missed it, but you know, one thing is Shabir, Shabir is sometimes just, he, he's trying to say, not that he believes this, but he'll, he'll say the Bible, like he'll say Paul taught that Jesus was a, 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 an exalted creature. Oh, you heard him, right? He said, Paul says some tantalizing things, right? Paul says some tantalizing things, but he doesn't teach that Jesus is God Almighty. Well, you know, of course he does, and I, I showed that in the debate. But that doesn't mean that Shabir is saying that Jesus is an exalted creature. He doesn't, he doesn't hold that Jesus is the first creature. He doesn't really believe that he was before the world began. But, but I think if JD, this might be JDR's point, but. Um, if Shabir is admitting that the Bible says he existed before the world began, and I didn't catch that, you know, there's a lot going on in debate. I didn't, I didn't hear that. But if he said that, then whether he believes the Bible or not, he's admitting that Jesus is not a creature because if he existed before the world began, in, in biblical cosmology, there can't be anything before creation began except the creator. And so Jesus would have to be the creator, according to that line of reasoning. Um, 
Waylon said, Taylor Stewart said on Discord that he won his debate with you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's on record, isn't it? Um, Reginard said, uh, you did a superb job in the debate, Anthony. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Um, Nada says, I catch your drift. And now at this point, I forgot what my drift was, Nada. <laughs> But, uh, oh, I think you're talking about the, the fact about Allah's loin. So I, I'm, and by the way, can, can everybody hear me? Um, I'm assuming you can. Nobody's complaining. But I, I noticed that as I look at the, as I look at the microphone, I'm, I'm not using my, my setup back at my house. I'm actually in this dumpy Motel 6. Um, we, we were, uh, we were in a nice hotel down there in California, but on the way back, you know, we got, some of you came in late, but we, we had a flat tire, so we didn't make it as far as we wanted to. And my tire was stuck. I, I got the lug nuts off and the tire was stuck on there. And here, here's the funny thing. So I'm sitting there and Eddie Dalcor and uh, uh, another friend, who doesn't like his name mentioned, so I don't. I won't mention it. He he goes by Truth Defenders. You've seen him in in here, but um, they're over there trying to tell me how to get it off. You know, they're they're saying use lubricant and all this kind of stuff, and I'm like, I don't got any lubricant in my car. And so then I went on YouTube. YouTube is, I mean, it's it's a lifesaver. So many times it's a lifesaver. So we're waiting for a tow truck because we're out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, I, you know, they're, they're telling me they're going to take an hour and a half and, and we're waiting there for like an hour. And I'm, I'm thinking, keep trying the wheel, trying to get it off. And then I'm watching this YouTube video. And in the video, this guy said, he's in a shop, right? And he says, well, you just take a, a sledgehammer and you pound it from the inside, right? And I'm like, yeah, well, who's driving around carrying a sledgehammer? Well, as soon as I thought that to myself, this is why, yeah, lug nuts. Anthony said lug nuts right after talking about Allah's gonads. <laughs> uh, that was entirely unintentional. But anyways, um, but uh, I, I, I'm sitting there thinking, who, who drives around with a sledgehammer in their trunk, right? But as soon as I said that, I, I remembered, you know, we, we stopped on the way from California in Nevada, where my mom lives, and because my dad died back in May, I, I flew out there for the funeral and I didn't take anything home or anything. I mean, I, I mailed some stuff from there that she wanted me to take of his, but most of the stuff I left there. And, you know, since I drove there this time to avoid the COVID airport, all that kind of stuff, fiasco. And so my son could drive and so forth. Um, I thought, oh, I got my car here so I can bring a bunch of stuff back. And one of the things I put in my car is a sledgehammer. So I got under the car and I pounded off the tire. And uh, then I was able to put the spare on. So the tire still has a donut on it. Um, oh, here's Truth Defenders as we speak. I was just giving them my uh, my uh, crazy... Uh, you can confirm. He saw the pictures. He saw the pictures of me laying on the ground changing my tire. Um, anyway, so, uh, I think I covered all that stuff that I was trying to say on the Hadith regarding Allah's gonads. Um, so yo mama asked me, who do you think won DW or J Smith? Um, uh, hold on a sec. I got to remember radical loves question here too. Um, who do I think won? Now, first of all, um, I didn't watch the whole debate. So if you recall, I debated Shabir. The first debate I did with Shabir was at 12. Uh, then I, I had a brief intermission and debated, and they were supposed to be bringing me some food and nobody did. Then I debated Shabir again for another couple of hour, hours. And so I didn't, I don't think I finished debating until like five. So I was debating from 12 to five. David and Jay debated sometime after that. And after that, you know, I'm trying to wind down. I'm walking outside, getting air, uh, getting some food. Um, 
And so my son sat there and he watched it and I started to watch it. I don't remember when, but I, I watched, I watched basically both of their opening statements. So I can't give you my honest appraisal just yet. My honest appraisal. Obviously, you know that from uh, David's standpoint, it doesn't matter to him if he loses that debate in the sense that if he's wrong, so much the worse for Muhammad and all the better for the rest of us. Uh, but either way, you know, if, if, if he's right and Jay's wrong, Muhammad was clearly a false prophet, the most obvious false prophet in history. And so it's sort of a win-win thing. That's why he had no trouble walking into that. I will say this, you know, David, um, uh, my, 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 uh, well, I'll say this going into it. I side with the notion that Muhammad existed. That doesn't mean that I dismiss what Jay has to say because I'm just not as familiar with some of the stuff that he's talking about. So I'd have to honestly look at that and say, um, I'd have to, I'd have to look at it and see if it, you know, what cogency there is there. How, you know, at the same time, I'd say I have a basic idea of, of what, uh, Lord Raven says, just say, Dr. J is right. He might be right. I don't know. But I, you know, the, what I know are the Islamic sources, right? My knowledge of the Islamic sources means that Muhammad is as false as they come. And it's sort of like by Muslims saying these are our sources, they're saying here's the rope that you can hang us with, right? They're bringing the rope to their own hanging. So it's never bothered me to simply take for granted these sources, basically. I mean, sure, I would, I would say that there are certain things that are obviously false, but in terms of, you know, Hadiths that say certain things that, you know, Muhammad's stealing the son, of, uh, the wife of his adopted son, that doesn't bother me uh, for them to admit that that's true because I'm going to use that to prove Muhammad's a false prophet, right? The satanic verses, I'll use that to prove Muhammad's a false prophet. But it may be that all those sources are not reliable. I mean, there's no question that there were people fabricating Hadith and there were people fabricating them on both sides. The Shia were fabricating Hadith. The Sunnis were fabricating Hadith. All these people are fabricating Hadith to justify a particular agenda, whether it was political, ethical, uh, doctrinal. They were doing everything under the sun. And so, um, you know, it, uh, but, but the, the issue is, you know, how good is the evidence against Muhammad's existence I mean, how, how good is the case for his non-existence? Because you don't get evidence for non-existence. You, you get an absence of evidence. And, but how, you know, there's, there's got to be a sufficient, there's got to be a sufficient, uh, there's got to be enough of that sort of thing to say we should expect this and it's not there. And if it's not there in all these cases, then we can say he doesn't exist. So anyways, I, I'm just basically pleading uh, ignorance here and I'm going to go, uh, you know, I had lunch and dinner and all that stuff with Jay. And um, I want to get Spencer's new book. He's doing an updated book on it. Um, and Jay, of course, has been doing stuff on it. And I just need to catch up on it. Um, so uh, I'll get to Chaldean's question in a minute. But I wanted to go back here to Radical Love. Radical Love asked me a question about George's conference in Charlotte. Um, so the question was, am I going to be at that conference. Now, George hasn't specifically asked me if I'm going to be at that conference, but it's right. It's it's in my neck of the woods, and uh, he probably will ask me. Um, and if he doesn't ask me, I can still go and, and, and be a part of, you know, like I can, I can be there at the conference. Just like Sam was a third wheel at this conference, right? Sam wasn't a speaker, but he was there singing like Elvis. Uh, in fact, in fact, I was going to play this. If, if I was at home, I would have put this on the computer so you could all see it. But um, instead, instead, I will play it for you, and hopefully it's not too bad. Um, oops. Oops. <laughs> now i got to find it again. Where did it go? Here you go. You want to see what a character Sam is? Sing us the song of 
there you have it, Sam, the third wheel singing away. Uh, yeah, that's that's sober, folks, because we don't drink. We don't get drunk. Um, <laughs> so I, I could go up to the Charlotte conference and be a third wheel like Sam, but George will probably ask me to speak. It's right there in 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 the vicinity of my domicile. So, uh, <laughs> um, all right. So somebody asked me, did I find it easy to debate Shabir? I, um, okay. Do you find it was easy? So that was Chaldean. Do you think his arguments were childish and easy to refute? Do you find he was challenging at all? So I was honestly just shocked. Well, I, I, I understand, I think, um, uh, Oh, bye Nada. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for the super chat. Uh, thank you for your prayers and your assistance and everything else, uh, making all this happen. Um, Sam seeking attention. Nate says, yeah, of course he, yeah, you is Sam, Sam. In fact, I should come up with a, an acronym, um, for Sam seeking attention, much seeking attention, much, <laughs> um, so, uh, Gosh, all these questions rapidly coming. JDR asked, why didn't you question Shabir to whom Allah prays? JDR, there are so many things I could have said to Shabir. There was no end. I, I But my problem was Shabir was hardly interacting with the, the things I did bring up. And so there's always room for five more debates. So uh, one of these days, maybe I'll bring that up in one of the debates. But there was, there, see, when I'm thinking of, a, of the debate, I'm thinking of, okay, uh, what what would Shabir likely say in response to this? What's my response to that? And then what would my response be to his response to that? And the problem is that Shabir never got to part two, right? He never got to, he, he tried to give an excuse, but he could never get past responding to my response. And so that just left me with having to, you know, refute what I already refuted. There was no second, third step to any of this. Right. In a chess game, you have to think three or four moves ahead. With Shabir, it was only thinking two moves ahead. He he just wasn't keeping up. And and so I was genuinely surprised at how weak I thought his uh, argumentation was. And again, I'm not being disrespectful here. Right. I I, I think I'm a respectful person. I uh, try to be forthright and so forth. These are serious issues. I'm going to say it like it is. I'm going to call something what it is. I'm going to tell Shabir if I think he's hucking and jiving and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just being honest when I say I was really surprised at how shallow uh, a lot of that was. But I will tell you some of what I think accounts for that. I think, number one, a lot of Christians who have debated Shabir, I'm not going to say all, I've heard people say really good stuff to Shabir, right? A lot of Christians who have debated Shabir have made some key missteps, okay? Unfortunately, unfortunately, since the 1800s, and I've talked about this before, since the 1800s, a lot of Christians have lost sight of Old Testament Trinitarianism, okay? A lot of Christians are familiar with the New Testament's case for the Trinity, but they are surprisingly weak when it comes to the Old Testament. And part of the reason for that is because Christians kind of, uh, you know, capitulated to the ravings of liberals who were saying that the Trinity is not in the Old Testament right? The, the Old Testament's Unitarian. And so they started to ignore the relevance of the Old Testament to this issue. I don't mean that conservative Christians stopped believing in the Trinity. They just thought that it was solely a New Testament revelation, that God didn't make that known until he, it got to the New Testament. And that and here's what happens as a result of that. This is what Shabir and other Muslims do. Shabir goes to the Old Testament, hammers away at the monotheistic passages of the Old Testament, hammers away at uh, the idea that Jews were Unitarians, just hammers away at that, and then tries to go into the New Testament with that momentum. And then says, look, Jesus affirmed the same thing, the Shema, Mark chapter 12. 
Paul in 1 Timothy 2 says there's only, you know, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus in John 17, 3 says, the Father's the only true God. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, for us there's but one God, the Father. James 2 says that the devils believe there's one God and tremble, right? So all these New Testament passages are saying the same thing as the Old Testament, which we know to teach Unitarianism, right? So that's that's what happens when you let go of the Old Testament, okay? So what I did in the debate, I think just sort of took the wind out of his sails, okay? I went into the Old Testament, and I spent more of my time in the Old Testament than I did in the New. I, I did spend time in the New Testament, but I completely took away the momentum, okay? So I think that Shabir wanted to start with the Old Testament, move to the New, then talk about church history, but I honestly think he was flabbergasted with I, you know, what I think was a watertight Old Testament case for uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing. But also notice this. When Shabir tries to argue from reason, when he, remember I told you he tries to do three things. Text, history, and reason. Okay, so he'll say the text doesn't teach it. It's a late development historically. And uh, wow, thank you so much, Craig Nelson. Thank you for that super chat. Um, you know, thank you everybody for the for the super chats. Um, but didn't ask a question. You guys are supposed to use those occasions to ask questions. But um, so when he gets to the issue of reason, consider this: one of the questions, and I don't remember, is it Sahi Sahi Luke? Did you deal with this question in one of your videos? Uh, Shabir likes to ask the question: How do you know? How do you know that there's only three persons in the Trinity, right? He'll say, okay, you've got Father, Son, and Spirit. How do you know there are only three persons? Have you ever heard that question from Shabir? He asks it all the time. Um, yeah, so I thought it was Sahi Luke. So I've seen your video on that. So, uh, but, but think about this. The reason that Shabir asked that question is because Shabir thinks that the Old Testament teaches only that there's one person. When we get to the New Testament, we now learn that there's a, fa a son and a spirit in addition to the father. And so the natural question is, well, how do you know that another person won't be revealed later? Okay, but if you recognize that the Old Testament from the beginning already taught three persons in the Godhead, and this is taught from the beginning all the way to the end, that sort of argument isn't even generated. You know, it, it's only generated by this idea that God is slowly revealing additional persons. But that's not the way the Bible is laying out the doctrine of the Trinity. God reveals himself as multipersonal, as triune, from the very first chapter. So I think, I think dealing with the Old Testament goes a long way in undermining sh what Shabir normally does. And by the way, there are other reasons to say there are only three persons in the Godhead. Not only do you have the, uh, uh, the fact that, that uh, the Old Testament, the, you know, the progress of Revelation is not an unrevealed Son and Spirit to a future revelation of Son and Spirit. Son and Spirit are revealed along with the Father. And while there are other truths that are unfolded and even more truths that we learn about those persons, the persons themselves are made known. That's not something that waited to be disclosed in the New, uh, in the New Testament. Um, so uh, th 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 there's, there's that fact. But then secondly, from a systematic theological standpoint, uh, Scripture tells us that God, what God has made known about himself uh, we're told that he has delivered the faith to the saints that once for all, we have everything that we need to know. God would not have withheld from us any essential truth uh, requisite to our salvation. So if, if there was a fourth person, then that would be problematic, right? Then it would mean God didn't disclose something fundamental to his identity, right? It's one thing to say there are depths to God's being we don't know, but to say we don't know the who of God, right? That would be problematic. Now, a third thing is that when you look at what is ascribed to Father, Son, and Spirit, 
we're told that all things are created from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. This exhausts the range of divine activity in these actions, leaving nothing left over for a fourth undisclosed person to have done. Okay, All things are from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. That exhausts the range of divine activity in creation, in providence, in redemption, in final consummation. So there's nothing left over for some fourth person to have been involved in. The fourth thing is, remember that all, the end of all of God's acts, according to Scripture, creation, providence, redemption, final consummation, the end or goal of all those acts is to bring glory to himself. And so this means if there was a fourth undisclosed person, that person uh, would go unglorified because he is unrevealed. Okay, So there's four reasons. Okay, The Old Testament from the beginning and all the way to the end of the Bible reveals consistently three persons. There's no reason to think there's a fourth. Uh, the whole Bible uh, gives us the, the deposit of faith that uh, once for all entrusted unto the saints, it's completed. Uh, so there, there's no fourth person. Third, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit, all things being created from, through, and in Father, Son, and Spirit exhausts the range of divine activity, leaving nothing left over for a fourth undisclosed person. Fourth, all the acts of God have as their goal the glorification of God, so that if a fourth person existed, he'd go unglorified, contrary to the end for which God made all things. Now, there are other arguments that I'll give you, and I plan to do a future session on this, but I haven't. Uh, I want to put some slides together to make it better for you all and, and so forth. Um, so somebody asked me what my favorite books are. I will come back to that. Um, so somebody says we should debate Allah's not Yahweh instead of Trinity. Part of the problem with that Terminator is Yahweh is the Trinity. And I mean, if you're just talking about arguing over words, I mean, I do agree that Yahweh is the name of God, the proper name or it, whatever its correct pronunciation is, Yehovah, or, you know, uh, in English, Jehovah. But the uh, we have to actually talk about what the Bible says about Yahweh and what the Quran says about Allah. We have to look at who they are and uh, not simply at, at the epithets used for them. But, I, you know, uh, I do agree there are other issues we can talk about, like the fundamental attributes of God and, and characteristics and so forth. Um, Brenda said, why do you think that oneness Unitarians can't distinguish between being and person? Well, Brenda, because the, uh, the mistake that people make, and I've, I've mentioned this before, I don't know if it was here or somewhere else, Sometimes people people confuse logic and experience. Okay, some Christians do do this as well. You'll hear Christians say things like, "The Trinity goes beyond reason." Okay, no, it doesn't. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. And I don't just mean here that it's. Well, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, it's not as if I'm not saying that a person could arrive at a knowledge of God triune apart from revelation just by reason. That's not my point, but it's apprehensible to reason. Uh, when, when revelation makes it known, we can uh, rationally understand what it means to say God is triune. But uh, people confuse logic and reason all the time. And I'll, I'll explain to you what I mean. By logic, all we mean are the relationship between propositions, okay, and whether or not they are validly related to each other to yield a particular conclusion. So if I say uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, all those propositions, the, the first two premises are validly related to each other and to the conclusion. The conclusion does follow from those premises. That's logical, right? Um, now I, let me ask you a question. Is, is it, is it, is the, I, it, here's, here's another statement. Um, there are horses and there are animals with horns. Therefore it's possible that there could be a horse with a horn, right? Possible logically, right? What we call unicorns. Now I, I'm just talking in terms of what's physically possible 
right? We all would grant that God could have created the unicorn if he wanted to, right? God could have created the unicorn. Nothing would stop him. Muslims would agree with that. Um, so there, but somebody might be tempted to say, you might hear somebody say, oh, it's illogical to believe that there's a unicorn. No, it's not strictly speaking illogical, except in the sense that you might say, well, you need evidence for something like that, right? But that's the point. Here, here's the mistake people are making. When we talk about experience, it is true to say that the Trinity goes beyond experience. We don't know any other being in our experience that is multi-personal. Okay? All other beings that we know have are, are one person. And so the belief in three persons in God goes beyond our experience. My next door neighbor is not like that. Nobody at the conference was like that. Nobody I've met in my life is like that. But that doesn't mean because God goes beyond human experience that what's true of God, I mean, since God is beyond human experience, meaning uh, meaning that God is supratemporal, right? God goes, God is uh, supra, uh, spatial. He, he, he doesn't, He's not confined by space or time or matter, right? God goes beyond all of these things. And that being the case, what's the point of objecting to him being three persons just because that goes beyond our experience, okay? So there's a difference between something going beyond our experience and something being uh, illogical or going beyond uh, what's rationally possible. And so... I think that's the fundamental problem that they're making. They think that their experience is the yardstick of what's true and possible. Um, okay, Chaldean asks, Sam said Jesus and the Father share the same spirit, but the spirit is a person, so they share the same person is also a spirit. Well, here's what Sam is probably saying. The, you have to distinguish between the, the spirit as a proper name for the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, right? That's his proper name, his distinguishing name within the Godhead. And the word spirit being used as a reference to God's fundamental essence or nature, okay? When you look at John 4, 24, when it says God is spirit, the statement is qualitative. It's referring to what God is in his essential nature. God is not flesh and bones. God is not a material being. God is immaterial. He is spirit. He doesn't have extension in space. That's different than the, the title Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has the same spiritual essence as father and son, but his specific title is Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. So that's what Sam is, is, is driving at when he says that. Um, and the reason that the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit, there are numerous reasons for that, but one reason is because each person in the Trinity assumes a special purpose in redemption. It's the, the son's, you know, the son or the father sends the son, the, the father plans redemption, he sends the son, it's out of his love that the son is given. And he represents the Godhead in receiving the sacrifice and his wrath being placated and, and so forth. The son comes and he dies, right? He sheds his blood and redeems sinners. And then the spirit comes and does what? He unites us to Christ and begins to transform us. He makes us holy. So the spirit's special work in redemption is that of making us holy, sanctifying us, setting us apart and transforming us to be like Christ. Um, so he is specifically called the Holy Spirit. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, thank you, by the way, Jeremy Wong. I saw your recent uh, Patreon thing, so thank you so much. Um, and I hope I didn't pass over any other questions, folks. Pardon me if I did. Uh, but uh, Jeremy Wong says, would uh, having the wrong doctrine of the Godhead mean you're not saved? If so, why? So, yes, the answer is yes. The, the, if you don't believe in the triune God, you don't have saving faith. Now, let me, let me qualify what I mean by that. I don't mean that a person has some perfect understanding of that. 
Um, I don't mean that everybody is a theologian of, you know, first rate, you know, caliber or anything like that. Um, I would say that all Christians have a rudimentary understanding when they come to faith. They, they may not be able to articulate it well, but they'll grow in their ability to do so. The, the sure indicator uh, that points away from like, like you could even have a person describe the Trinity in less than accurate ways, right? But they, they, they're not intending to. They're, they're trying to. They're just not yet sophisticated enough to properly articulate it. But if they're saved, they've come to know God as their father through Christ, the son, and they know themselves as adopted sons in, because he is God's true and proper son, his essential son. And they're able to do that because they have the spirit by whom they cry out, Abba, Father. Okay, so that is fundamentally Trinitarianism. But all of that may need to be filled out and they may need to grow in their understanding of that. And, and that's true for everyone. And along the way, they, they may make some inaccurate expressions about that. But, um, but uh, the... Uh, I was reading another comment, so I got distracted. But uh, the the real problem is when somebody argues against the Trinity, right? Now you know that this person is not just unsophisticated in their understanding, needing to grow or something like that. They are actually opposed to the doctrine of the Trinity, and, and therefore it's not fundamental to their belief. It is not part and parcel of... Uh, their salvation. That is not their experience. They don't know God that way. And now, now you asked why, how do, how do we know that it's important? It's necessary to believe in the Trinity. Well, the first thing I can tell you is the church has said this, right? I mean, now most importantly is the Bible. And I believe the church says this on the basis of the Bible, but the church has always said, this is fundamental to the Christian faith. And one of the reasons they've said that is consider, well, first of all, the, the first and greatest commandment is to uh, you know have no other gods. We are commanded to have no other God. We must believe in and worship the true God. We are to believe in the true God. There's nothing more fundamental to true religion. And I know some people don't like the word religion. Choose whatever word you wish. There's nothing more fundamental to the truth and to uh, piety and to uh, uh, right faith and conduct than what you believe about God and who your God is. And so it's not as if we can say, oh, these things over here are important. It's not so important what we believe about God. No, there's nothing more important than what we believe about God. And we shouldn't think that this is just sort of abstract in the air kind of stuff. No, this has very practical significance. I, I preached the other day. I preached after the conference. I preached on Sunday and I was preaching on uh, I was asked to preach on the Trinity. And one of the things I pointed out is. I mean, think about this. All Christians, Jews, and Muslims claim that God is self-sufficient, right? God is independent of everything else. God does not rely on anything. He doesn't need anything. He is wholly sufficient in and of, of himself. But now, is it possible for God to be self-sufficient and be Unitarian? Is the Islamic deity really self-sufficient? Is the Unitarian God of post-Christian Talmudic Judaism, contrary to Second Temple Judaism, Old Testament Judaism, is that God self-sufficient? No, that God necessarily has to look outside of himself in order to realize certain potentialities, in order to experience fellowship, in order to engage in communication, in order to interact in order to do any of those things that are actually fundamental to personhood, that kind of a deity requires other persons to exist. But you only have that in Trinitarianism in, in the sense that God is self-sufficient. If, if God is, can only uh, realize these potentials by creating things, then God is dependent on creation for all of these things. But now, so this means that God in, in Trinitarianism is self-sufficient. He doesn't need to look outside of himself. He did not create the world because he was lonely. 
He did not create the world because he wanted to fellowship with someone or talk to someone or because he needed to, right? Now, does that mean that God didn't create us for, and that our purpose is not to fellowship with him? That he didn't create us to fellowship with him? Okay, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying God didn't create us because he needed us to have fellowship. But he created us and we need fellowship. That's our purpose for existing, right? So, but, but here's, the, here's the point I'm, I'm making, the practical significance of this. It is precisely because God is self-sufficient that he can be all-sufficient for us, okay? A God is who is not self-sufficient cannot be all-sufficient for his creatures. A God who is dependent on his creatures is in the same boat we are. Right? How do we know that a million years down the road that God's, uh, you know, uh, potential is not going to run out or whatever? Right? The God of the Bible is self-sufficient, and therefore He can be all-sufficient for His creatures. That's why the God of the Bible is the only one in whom a believer can find true rest. You know, sometimes people look to their spouse, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have. Uh, you know, solace in your spouse to some degree. Sometimes people look to their job. Sometimes people look to this. Sometimes people look to that. No person is ever going to find a, a true satisfying rest in anything other than God. He alone is self-sufficient and therefore all sufficient for you. So the Trinity is not irrelevant. It, it's, it's the fundamental basis of all true belief and piety and, I mean, it's fundamental to everything that we think and do as Christians. We pray to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. The, uh, the Father, you know, loved the world that he gave his Son. The Son came and died for our redemption. The Spirit came and applied the merits of Christ to us. He united us to Christ and he dwells in us and cries out in us, enabling us to say, Abba, Father. So all of this is fundamental to the true, the true faith. Um, all right, so I have been driving a long time. I'll take a couple more questions before uh, before uh, hitting the sheets. Um, Pseudo Lysander Spooner, quite a name, says, uh, why do you think Orthodox Jews are so friendly towards Islam despite the explicit anti-Jewishness of the Quran? Is it because they see Islam as being anti-Christian? So, you know, it's interesting um, that I've met Jews of different sorts that would fall on different sides of this. If you, a lot of Jews today are influenced by uh, Rabbi Moses ben Mahmanides, right? Uh, otherwise known as Rambam, right? Moses ben Mahmanides or Moshe ben Mahmanides. And Mahmanides was a Muslim, or excuse me, a, a Jewish rabbi who was raised in Islamic Spain and then went to other places in the Islamic world, and he was heavily influenced by Islamic philosophers, okay? He was heavily influenced by Islamic philosophers, like Al-Ghazali and others, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, anyways, the certain uh, Islamic philosophers in, uh, in his time period. And these philosophers, if you listen to certain Muslims today, they hate the fact that there were certain Muslims who were philosophers in their history because they consider most of them heretics, right? Especially if they're Salafis. But the Muslim philosophers typically were Mu'tazili in their thinking. They rejected... Uh, the notion of attributes, they thought Allah was devoid of attributes and stuff like that. And so Mahmanides actually came to adopt that position and incorporated it into Judaism. So if you meet a Jew who actually knows his stuff, he'll tell you that uh, uh, God has no attributes. But they didn't get this from the Bible. They got that from... Muslim philosophers get, uh, uh, you know, Rambam getting it from Muslim philosophers. And so 
when Rambam looked at Islam and he looked at Christianity, he saw Christianity as saw Islam as essentially Muatizalism, and he saw Christianity as Trinitarianism. And so to his mind, there was at least that fundamental similarity between the two. But the Muatizali way of thinking has nothing to do with the Old Testament, has nothing to do with ancient Judaism. It is medieval Judaism under the influence of uh, Rambam, who is under the influence of Muslim philosophers. And so that's basically infected a lot of contemporary Judaism today. And so contemporary Jews will look askant at Christians, but look positively at Muslims. But the, part of the so they'll read Rambam speaking positively of Muslims. But what they don't know is Orthodox Sunni Muslims today reject all of that. They reject the, the teaching of their philosophers. They reject uh, the things that were taught by uh, these guys. They reject what uh, Rambam taught about God. So it, they've basically been hoodwinked at, by this point because uh, all of that has uh, changed. So anyways, um, so Craig asked, do I think Shabir is moving towards Quran only? I think he's just being a, a lot more selective, right? And he, But he's not going to... The, the, the problem is that... You know, he wants to say certain hadith are valid, but others aren't. But he's never going to really commit to a particular criteria and say these these hadiths are sound and these hadiths aren't. It's always going to be this hadith is sound when I want to use it, when it's good for me. This hadith is not sound when I don't like it and don't want to use it. That's why. And I and, and this this proves it. If you look at the debate, notice he did not give a single argument against the particular hadith that I gave. All he did was said that there are certain hadiths that are fabricated and we don't, you know, uh, we, we have certain criteria. Yeah, we, yeah, they do, right? According to the criteria that's been accepted, all the, all the hadith narrations I gave were from uh, Sahih uh, Bukhari, right, or Sahih Muslim. They were all Sahih narrations. I didn't quote a single non-Sahih narration. And so all he was doing was just basically saying, this one's not convenient for me right now. That one's not convenient. So we're just going to say certain things are fabricated. Uh, and he's trying to uh, be very slick about it because he didn't exactly say those were fabricated. He just, he spoke very generally. Some hadith are fabricated, right? So you're supposed to get the impression that those hadith aren't reliable, even though he didn't explicitly say that. He just said some hadith are, are fabricated, right? It's all just a, a cherry picking shell and pea game. Uh, Truth Defender said, Shabby will be watching your vids, including this one, to see what you say and how he can try to refute you. What would you say to him uh, so that he doesn't bring the same tired arguments? <laughs> no, I'd say bring it. I'd say uh, I'd say bring bring the tired arguments, and we'll go. And because I, I, you know, I. I couldn't refute any arguments he didn't bring up. So uh, if he wants to bring uh, bring up more arguments, I'm happy to go around too. Um, so Truth Speaker asked, did I write a script of the debate? Actually, here's something interesting. While I was driving here from Nevada to uh, Arizona, right before I got my flat, so you can thank George, but George called me. George is the one who organized the debate between me and Shabir, or Shabir and I. Um, George said to me, he said, he said, I've got somebody transcribing the debate. And then he says he's going to talk to Shabir because I said, I said, send the transcript to me and I'll edit it because I, I have, I have good, for some reason I can pick out typos really easy. So I just said, send it to me and I'll, I'll edit it. And then he said, I'm going to ask Shabir if he would mind us doing that. And then maybe you guys doing a, maybe there's some arguments that you would have liked to have made better or something you didn't get to, you want to address and we can have you guys write an addendum to the debate. Um, and then he said, he was almost suggesting that we like turn this into like this bigger thing, you know, where we go a couple more rounds. So uh, if that happens, uh, and I forgot who asked the question, but if that happens, then I will be sure to let everybody know. Okay, that was truth speaker. Um, I will let everybody know uh, when that is completed. And truth defender says he catches Anthony's typos. 
Um, but notice that Truth Defenders didn't even spell his name right. I'm just kidding. I said that so he'd look. But uh, <laughs> um, oh, Shake asked why there wasn't cross examination. I don't. I don't know. Um, I didn't organize that. I just went with the flow. I wish there would have been. It would have been great. Um, yeah. See, Truth Defender said, "Got me." <laughs> I knew I'd get you. Um, Nate Two D Two said, "Any juicy gossip about vocab Malone?" Oh man, are you? Well, first of all, I can tell you there is juicy gossip about vocab. There is juicy gossip about vocab. For example, he's not as cool as I am. He's not as cool as I am. I know that you want you want more, but uh, maybe I, I ought to have vocab on the show someday, and we can talk about <clears throat> all the ways Anthony Rogers is cooler than vocab. No, I say that because, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to get as cool as vocab, isn't it? Going on air with his shades on. Um, I should put shades on, though, because, you know, we, you have to put these lights in front of you so you get good. Um, oh, wow. Thank you so much, Samra. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you. Praise the Lord. And I, I hope the Lord will bless you and everybody else uh, who's who's done a super chat. Thank you so much. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe sunglasses would help. I just think it kind of looks for me. I feel like I'd be I'd feel a little awkward wearing sunglasses inside, uh, you know, but it works for vocab, you know, it works for him. He's got that soul vibe going on, you know, the whole uh, ambiance and all of that. Um. But yeah, I'll have to think of a good vocab story. I mean, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, but um, I just can't think of one at the moment, probably because I'm tired. Um, in fact, you just reminded me that vocab didn't come for the conference. I told him ahead of time and he was supposed to come down. Um, KL says vocab needs help with the BHI. Yeah, I need to catch up with all of that. I mean, it, they haven't been my special focus, but vocab will tell you. Uh, I shock vocab sometimes with uh, with what I know about uh, the whole consciousness community because, you know, I tend to focus mostly on the stuff that's around me. Like, you know, there's – I always tell people this, you know. Um, oh, DM Laney says, who did you debate? I debated Shira, Shabir Ali. We did two debates, one on the Trinity – and one on Tawheed. Both of those debates are available on the Act 17 Apologetics YouTube page. Um, Nate2D2 asked who would win in a beard off. Now, I, I'm going to guess vocab. I bet he could grow a better beard than me. And I've seen him start to grow one. But I, I, grew, I was growing my beard out for the debate. But I didn't like it. You know, other people said I should keep it. David said I should keep it. He was telling me, he says, he goes, because it, it covers up your skinny jaw, which looks like you can knock, you can be knocked out with one punch. That's what David said. So he said the beard made me look more rugged. Um, <laughs> uh, but David's just a big bully. So I didn't really take that to heart. So um, I don't know though. It just looked ugly to me. I mean, it, like it stuck out and Maybe I need to use some of that fancy oil stuff. And I just, it felt so nice to wash my face and know that it was actually doing the job. And uh, and know that yesterday's dinner wasn't still in there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, some people told me they liked it. I just, you know, to me, I'd look in the mirror and I'd think it's sticking out. And um, I don't know. So people tell me it looks good. I mean, see, I didn't know it looked so good. Um, all right, Sahilouk's got to go. And I actually have to go too, uh, folks, because I got a donut on my car and I got to get up early in the morning and get it fixed with a, I got to go find a place to get a new tire. And then we are hitting the road again in order to try and make it. Uh, we're trying to make it to South Carolina by Saturday evening. Um, so that's the goal. It is... Thursday evening, wait, Thursday evening, right? Yeah, so it's going to take us two more days of travel, but only if I can get that tire fixed in a judicious amount of time. Um, 
Thank you for your prayers. Thank you, Jeremy Wong. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Carm. Thank you, um, Slam RN, my mods, Carm and Slam. Uh, thank you, everybody else. Radical Love, General Hud, Chaldean, Craig Nelson, Soldier, Nim, DM Laney, Sahi Luke, Alex Haig, Truth Defenders, um, and uh, I think Riaz Qureshi was here. Thank you, Samra, Catherine Linda, Warrior Woman, all the rest of you, Lord Raven. Um, I know I missed somebody, but uh, I do thank you all. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may he uh, extend his grace and peace to you. And God bless you and have a good night.